Can a scientific discovery be revolutionary? Even if its inventor is, uh, well, a little out there. Hmm. Today we're diving into the world of PCR, a technique that's become essential in everything from medicine to forensics. Yeah. But the story behind it. Oh, yeah. It's a real head scratcher. It is. Involving a Nobel Prize winning biochemist named Carrie Mullis. Right. A guy who is known to dabble in LSD mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and challenge pretty much every scientific norm. It's fascinating how someone so unconventional could stumble upon a technique so fundamental. Exactly. Yeah. We're talking about a guy who, back in his grad school days at UC Berkeley, reportedly synthesized a hallucinogenic drug for his dissertation experiment. Wow. I mean, talk about pushing boundaries, right? Yeah. But here's the thing. Okay. The same guy, years later, while cruising down the California highway, had a flash of insight they would change the course of molecular biology forever. Greer. That flash of insight. Yeah. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. And PCR is no small feat. It's like having a DNA photocopier, allowing scientists to take a tiny snippet of DNA and create billions of copies in a matter of hours. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? It is. Think about all the things we take for granted today. Yeah. Diagnosing diseases. Right. Tracing ancestry, even those at-home COVID tests. Mm -hmm. All of that hinges on this one technique. Yeah. But back in 1983, when Mullis first had this epiphany, the scientific community wasn't exactly lining up to applaud him. Well, Mullis wasn't exactly known for his rigorous scientific methods. Right. In fact, there were rumors that his initial experiments lacked proper controls, which raised some eyebrows among his colleagues at Cetus Corporation, where he was working at the time. Yeah. You can imagine the scene. Oh, I can. A free-spirited surfer dude known for his eccentric ideas <laughs> walks into a lab meeting and claims he's figured out how to multiply DNA. Oh. Not exactly textbook science, right? It, uh... But here's where it gets interesting. Okay. Despite the initial skepticism and Mullis's, shall we say, unconventional approach, the team at Cetus recognized the potential of PCR. They saw beyond Mullis's eccentricities and focused on refining the technique, transforming it from a wild idea into a reliable scientific tool. So they took this wild idea and turned it into a workhorse of modern biology. But how does PCR actually work? It's a bit like a recipe with a few key ingredients. Okay, I'm all ears laid on me. First, you need the DNA. You want to copy your template? Think of it as the master copy you're working from. Got it. What's next? Next, you need primers, short sequences of DNA that act like bookmarks telling the copying machinery where to start and stop. So the primers flank the specific gene or region of DNA we're interested in. Exactly. They zero in on the target. But the real star of the show is an enzyme called DNA polymerase. This is the molecular machine that does the actual copying adding nucleotides one by one to create a new strand of DNA. So it's like the polymerase is reading the template DNA and building a complementary strand, like a mirror image. You got it. But there's a catch. Most DNA polymerases can't handle high temperatures. They fall apart. And that's a problem because... Uh... Because PCR relies on repeated cycles of heating and cooling, we need to heat the DNA up to separate the two strands, like unzipping a zipper, so the polymerase can access the single strands and start copying. Okay, I see the dilemma. So how do they overcome this heat issue? That's where our eccentric friend Kerry Mullis comes back into the picture. Remember how he was fascinated by extremophiles, those organisms that thrive in extreme environments? Yeah, he even wrote a paper on time reversal in cosmology, another wild idea. Well, that fascination led him to an unlikely source, a bacterium Clinthermis aquaticus, discovered in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. This bacterium thrives in boiling water, and it produces a special kind of DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase. Wait, so they found a bacterium that could handle the heat and used its polymerase for PCR? Exactly. TAC polymerase was a game changer. It could withstand the high temperatures needed for PCR, making the whole process much more efficient and automated before TAC polymerase scientists were using enzymes that would break down during the heating step, so they had to add fresh enzyme after every cycle. Talk about tedious. No kidding. Mm -hmm. So TAC polymerase streamlined the whole process, allowing PCR to become the powerful tool it is today. It's amazing how a bacterium from a boiling hot spring ended up revolutionizing molecular biology. But let's get back to the process itself. You mentioned these cycles of heating and cooling. Can you break down what happens in each cycle? Absolutely. Each cycle has three main steps. Denaturation, annealing, and extension denaturation is the heating step, 
where the double-stranded DNA is separated into single strands. Like unzipping the DNA zipper, right? Perfect analogy. Then comes annealing, where the temperature is lowered, allowing those primers to bind to their target sequences on the single-stranded DNA. So the primers are like little flags marking the start and stop points for the polymerase. Precisely. And finally, extension, where the temperature is raised again to the optimal temperature for TAC polymerase. The polymerase grabs onto the primer and starts adding complementary nucleotides, building a new strand of DNA. So in each cycle, we're doubling the number of DNA copies. That's where the chain reaction comes in. Exactly. It's exponential growth. You start with one copy, then two, then four, then eight, and so on. After 30 or 40 cycles, you have billions of copies of your target DNA. That's incredible. And all thanks to a little bacterium from Yellowstone and a biochemist with a penchant for pushing boundaries. But PCR isn't just about making copies of DNA. It's about what we can do with those copies. That's where the real power of PCR lies. It's opened up a world of possibilities, from diagnosing genetic diseases to solving crimes to even rewriting evolutionary history. Speaking of possibilities, let's dive into some of the incredible applications of PCR. Where do we even begin? Well, one area where PCR has made a profound impact is in medical diagnostics. Imagine being able to detect a viral infection like HIV or hepatitis C from a single drop of blood or identifying a genetic mutation that predisposes someone to cancer. That's personalized medicine at its finest. And it's all thanks to PCR's ability to amplify those tiny traces of DNA, making them detectable. Exactly. PCR has revolutionized how we diagnose and manage infectious diseases, genetic disorders, and even cancer. It's also become an indispensable tool in forensics. Remember those crime shows where they analyze DNA evidence? That's PCR in action. I always wondered how they could get a DNA profile from a tiny blood stain or a single hair. It seems like magic. It's not magic, it's science. PCR allows forensic scientists to amplify DNA from minute samples, even degraded ones, providing crucial evidence in criminal investigations. It's even been used to exonerate innocent people who were wrongfully convicted. Talk about a powerful tool for justice. And what about evolutionary biology? Mm. How has PCR helped us unravel the mysteries of the past? It's like having a time machine for genetics. PCR allows us to extract DNA from ancient remains like fossils or mummies and amplify specific genes to study evolutionary relationships, migration patterns, and even ancient diseases. So we can trace our ancestries, understand how humans migrated across the globe, and even learn about the diseases that plagued our ancestors, all thanks to PCR. Exactly. It's given us an unprecedented glimpse into the history of life on Earth. But PCR's reach extends far beyond the lab. It's being used in agriculture to identify genetically modified organisms in environmental monitoring, to track endangered species, and even in food safety to detect foodborne pathogens. It seems like PCR has touched nearly every aspect of our lives, from healthcare to law enforcement to our understanding of the world around us. It's truly a revolutionary technique. It is, but as with any powerful technology, there are also potential downsides. PCR's ability to amplify and analyze DNA so easily raises some ethical considerations we need to address. That's a great point. We've explored the brilliance of PCR and its incredible applications, but now it's time to face the shadows to consider the ethical implications of this powerful tool. Yeah, it's like we've opened Pandora's box. We have this incredible tool, PCR, that's revolutionized so many fields. Right. But it's also raised a whole host of ethical questions that we can't ignore. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? On the one hand, PCR has the potential to unlock incredible advances in personalized medicine, helping us diagnose and treat diseases with unprecedented precision. Yeah. But on the other hand, it raises concerns about genetic privacy and the potential for discrimination. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine a world where your genetic information is readily accessible and employers or insurance companies could use that information to discriminate against you. Right. It's a scary thought. It is. And it's not just a hypothetical scenario. There have already been cases where genetic information has been used to deny people employment or insurance coverage. So how do we balance the potential benefits of PCR with the need to protect individual rights and privacy? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? We need robust legal frameworks that safeguard genetic information while also fostering responsible innovation in fields like personalized medicine. It's a delicate balance. We need to ensure that people can benefit from the advances in genetic testing without fearing that their information will be used against them. But it's not just about laws and regulations. Right. It's also about education and awareness. Absolutely. People need to understand the implications of genetic testing before they consent to it. They need to know what information is being collected, how it will be used, and who will have access to it. And that brings us to another ethical consideration. 
the rise of direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. These companies are making it easier than ever for people to learn about their ancestry and health risks. Mm. But it's also raising concerns about data privacy and the potential for misuse of genetic information. It's a bit of a wild west out there right now. Some of these companies have vast databases of genetic information, and it's not always clear how that information is being used or protected. It's a reminder that we need to be cautious consumers when it comes to our genetic information. We need to ask questions, read the fine print, and understand the potential risks before we hand over our DNA. Yeah, and it's also important to remember that genetic information is not just about individuals. It's uh -huh. also about families and communities. Right. Your genetic information is shared with your relatives, so decisions about genetic testing shouldn't be made in isolation. Exactly. There needs to be a broader conversation about the ethical, social, and legal implications of genetic testing. It's not just a matter for scientists and policymakers to decide. Right. It's something that affects all of us. It's a powerful reminder that science is not just about discoveries and breakthroughs. It's also about values and choices. And as PCR continues to evolve and shape our world, we need to be mindful of the ethical challenges it poses. We can't just focus on the science. We need to have these tough conversations about privacy discrimination and the responsible use of genetic information. Because ultimately, the future of PCR and of genetics as a whole depends not just on our scientific ingenuity, but also on our ethical wisdom. So as we wrap up this deep dive into the world of PCR, we leave you with this thought. What role do you think individuals should play in shaping the ethical landscape of genetic testing and research? It's a question that deserves careful consideration as we navigate this brave new world of personalized medicine and genomic discovery.